son of Sam, terrorized New York City from 1976 to 1977. David Berkowitz used a 44 caliber handgun to commit several random shootings across the city. He killed six people and he wounded seven others. Police eventually arrested him exactly 40 years ago today. The city of New York was actually experiencing a massive nervous breakdown. There was palpable fear in the hearts of people in the streets of the city at night. One man terrorized 16 million people. This was a mystery. Nobody had even a clue as to who was doing this. Well, I lost my ability to love, have compassion. I became an animal. For 13 months, David Berkowitz prowled the streets looking for young women to kill. He called himself the Son of Sam and stirred up the emotions of hardened New Yorkers with his haunting words and hateful deeds. On Christmas Eve, 1975, David Berkowitz attacked a 14-year-old girl with a knife. As he tried to stab the girl through her winter coat, she screamed and struggled in his arms. Berkowitz cut himself with the knife. It was so traumatically horrible to him that he vowed that he could never do that again. But then his mind went to work and he tried to figure out a different way to do it. At his next attempt, and all the ones to follow, Berkowitz would use a far more impersonal weapon. I became virtually a killing machine, a, a machine of destruction. In the summer of 1953, Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz adopted a three-day-old boy and brought him home to their small apartment in the Bronx. Little David was a blessing because the couple couldn't have children of their own. One of David's earliest memories was his parents telling him that he was adopted and that his real mother had died giving birth to him. Nathan Berkowitz worked six long days a week running a hardware store. Pearl was a homemaker who loved to show off her little boy. While David's childhood seemed normal enough, including Little League and occasional trips to Yankee Stadium with his father, David sensed early on that there was something wrong, something he could not express. When David fought with other boys in the neighborhood, they would taunt him saying, you're not a real kid, you're adopted. Worse than the shame he felt over being adopted was his guilt, knowing that his biological mother had died in childbirth. He would lie awake at night, fearing that his father was going to come and murder him in his bed because he had killed his biological mother. David's dark imagination was fueled by the many horror films he watched on television. He suffered from terrible nightmares, but was often too frightened even to speak about them. I would have these seizures that would come upon me where I'd start rampaging through the house and, and throwing things down and uh, rolling on the floor. Sometimes my dad had to just grab hold of me and pin me down to the floor till these seizures stopped. I just loved the darkness. There was something in me that just craved the darkness. I would lock myself in the closet for sometimes hours at a time, and my mom didn't even know I was in the house. At other times, I would just hide under my bed and stay that way for several hours. There, there were times at night when I just felt a, a, a craving or an urge to just go outside. Sometimes I would sneak down my fire escape and just wander the alleyways, wander the streets, one o'clock, two o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, and then sneak back the same way. Sometimes my parents didn't even know that I was gone. I had no joy in my heart. I had no happiness. I, I felt mentally confused. I was struggling in school. I was cutting out of school. I, I just couldn't be controlled. Berkowitz hated school and would run home as fast as he could to be with his mother, whom he adored. She was only too happy to dote on her only child. David, in turn, secretly poisoned his mother's parakeet to eliminate what he regarded as a rival for her affections. She never suspected her little angel. Despite David's adoration for his mother, he could also be cruel to her. 
The only person he really felt close to in the whole world wasted away in the cancer ward and then died. David cried for days. I was a lot closer to my mom than I was to my dad. My dad, I mean, he had to work all the time, six days a week. It wasn't his fault. And then I really, I had, had trouble, lots of trouble all through my youth, you know, emotional problems and things, mental problems. And uh, when she died, of course, then I lost everything. The 18-year-old Berkowitz enlisted in the Army. He was full of patriotic fervor and fantasized about dying a heroic death in Vietnam. Instead, he was shipped to Korea and qualified as a sharpshooter with an M16 rifle. He tried to find a girlfriend among the Korean prostitutes who hung around the base, but he found the effort degrading. David wrote to his father, apologizing for being a burden and amounting to nothing in society. He wrote that he was sorry he turned out the way he did, stupid, hateful, ugly, destructive. Berkowitz begged his father to pretend he never had a son, to forget that he even existed. Nathan remarried and decided to move to Florida and retire. Berkowitz resented his new stepmother and her daughter for invading his home and taking away his father. The 21-year-old began to feel that there was a mysterious force around him that repelled people. He referred to himself as Deschmutz, Yiddish for dirty one. His world was rapidly shrinking. Berkowitz moved into his own apartment and got a job as a warehouse security guard on the docks of the west side of Manhattan. From the depths of his loneliness, he began to think about the birth mother he never knew, the one whose death weighed on his conscience. Berkowitz would soon unravel the mystery of who he really was. What he found would propel him onto the street in search of blood. David Berkowitz began a desperate quest at the age of 21 to find out exactly whose son he really was. But instead of saving him from his misery, his journey to discover his birth parents would launch Berkowitz on a year-long killing spree. Berkowitz called his adoptive father, Nathan, and demanded the truth. Nathan broke the news that David's birth mother was, in fact, alive. He explained that the adoption experts had advised against revealing the truth. Berkowitz was stunned. In an instant, he was delivered from a lifetime of guilt. He had not caused his mother's death after all. Berkowitz's adoption papers said that his real name was Richard David Falco and that his parents were Betty and Tony Falco. He searched for them for months, but he kept hitting dead ends. Frustrated and lonely, Berkowitz, who had tried during his army years to find comfort in religion, now joined a cult of Satan worshipers. Berkowitz enjoyed the late night rituals in the woods the chanting, the drugs, and the opportunity to meet girls. He connected easily to the dark forces that the group worshipped. He even made a blood pact to serve the devil. I was chanting the names of Lucifer over and over, and I was calling out to him. I said, oh, you know, son of the morning, and, and uh, prince, my prince, my lord, you know, come into, my, uh, come into me right now, take control of this vessel. And uh, I felt like I was being emptied of my own personality and that something else somehow was coming in. The group gave Berkowitz a sense of belonging to a family and he eagerly accepted their mission. I was lonely, I had no real companionship and uh, I was invited to a party one day. I went to the party, this was in the Bronx. A couple of guys said, uh, hey listen, we in, you know, you're looking for a girl or something, you're looking for a good time. We got some uh, friends that meet in a park nearby. So I went over to the park and uh, we went deep into the woods. This was Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx. And they had like a small fire going and a lot of people were drinking. They were singing. Uh, they had some people were chanting. And I says, well, what is this, you know? And I began to meet some of the people and they says, oh, well, you know, we're pagans. We're witches and we just have a good, we come out here to have a good time but they were the ones that introduced me to uh, Satanism. We had circles, we had the pentagrams that they made right there in the woods, in the high weeds, in the swampy area. And uh, we would just call upon these different powers. They said, call upon these angels. Later on, I found out that these were really demons that we were calling upon. 
but I would do these rituals and, and meditate, and you, you could feel this surge of energy come upon you. The, things began to change within me. It always seemed that I had some type of connection with the devil. It always just seemed that I had this fascination with uh, horror movies and uh, things of that nature. I always felt like the devil was around. We had worshipped uh, a powerful occultic deity named Sam Hain. Uh, he is one of the high-ranking demons, and he was the one we used to call upon all the time. And it became somehow abbreviated to, to Sam. I really thought that I was some kind of soldier in a satanic army, and we had determined to, to bring New York City to its knees, to initiate a reign of terror. And looking back, it was, it was, it was a tragedy. Innocent lives were lost, my life was ruined, other people's lives were ruined, and we brought nothing but hurt and pain. There is, there is a pattern uh, of, of how Satan works, and he doesn't come out at the beginning and just destroy a life. He will come in little by little. When I got involved with Satanism, I mean, I wish I had known from the beginning how far this thing would have gone. As unbelievable as it sounds, what started as animal sacrifices, Began, people began to talk about making human sacrifices. And I never knew at the beginning that this stuff was going to result in murder. Satan never jumps on a person all at once. He'll chew away at them. And in case of David's life, it's exactly the same. It, he moves in for the kill, and then he pounces and finishes a person off. You can't really rationalize the future. You know, you just kind of figure the devil will get you out of it. The devil figure out a way. Look, we're serving the devil, we're soldiers. He'll make a way for, of escape, but that's a lie. I began to realize that the devil was not going to get me out of this thing when uh, I was sentenced to more than 300 consecutive years in prison, which means that theoretically I'll be in here forever. It seems so innocent at, at the start, uh, but uh, the devil... Re he kind of, he didn't tell you what the end was going to be, that it was going to cost me my very life. And uh, at that time, it was too late. When I grew up, you know, I had, I had no real fear of God, no real respect for God. I didn't know anything about Him. And I just did whatever I felt like doing, whatever felt good. But I had no idea that there would really be a consequence for those actions. Uh, I mean, I know that if you did something wrong and you got caught, you're going to be punished. But you know, when you do something, you think, yeah, I'm going to get away with this. Nobody's going to catch me. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, it's already been seen. It's already been tabulated. It's already been written down. His other mission, to track down his biological parents, was finally accomplished after a year of searching. When he first spoke on the phone with his birth mother, Betty Falco, David's expectations soared. Berkowitz hid his disappointment and told Betty that he loved her and forgave her because he knew she must have had a good reason for giving him up. Betty revealed to David that Tony Falco wasn't his real father. Betty Falco had secrets, too. Betty, a daughter of poor Jewish immigrants, had married Tony as a teenager. After they had a daughter named Roslyn, Tony left Betty for another woman. Betty had then begun a long affair with Joseph Kleinman, a well-to-do Jewish businessman who was married with three children. In 1953, David was born. Kleinman would not tolerate the embarrassment of an illegitimate child. Betty, too, felt guilty and ashamed and quickly made arrangements for an adoption. He learns at the moment of his imagined rebirth that he had intruded upon the lives of these two people who were simply together having sex. Berkowitz's relief over not having killed his birth mother quickly turned to anger. He later wrote, 
Here I was, never wanting to be born in the first place, miserable, maladjusted, plagued with death fantasies, only to find out that I was unwanted, an accident after all. This moment of truth lit a fuse in Berkowitz, but he never let his feelings show. For a while, he even maintained a relationship with his half-sister and her two daughters, who called him Uncle Richie and would jump into his arms when he arrived for dinner. Berkowitz's visits grew less and less frequent, then stopped altogether. He later wrote, I was getting a very powerful urge to kill most of my natural family. I fought hard to keep these thoughts from becoming actions. So I just stayed away altogether. The 22-year-old Berkowitz mysteriously told his half-sister that he would never hurt her or her daughters. Instead, on Christmas Eve, 1975, Berkowitz attacked a 14-year-old girl in the Bronx with a small knife. The rage David had managed to keep under control for so long was starting to crack through his quiet exterior. The attack was too close a physical encounter for the withdrawn Berkowitz. The girl fought back, screamed, and escaped. Berkowitz decided that next time he'd use a gun. That Christmas Eve, a serial killer was born. In the bicentennial spring of 1976, Berkowitz was still working as a night watchman, but he complained that he couldn't sleep during the day because of howling dogs belonging to his landlord. He quit his job and moved to an apartment on the Hudson River outside the city, only to find more incessantly barking dogs in his new neighborhood. From 1976 to 1977, Berkowitz drove a taxi, worked in the post office, and tried to live with his paranoid feelings. He would often drive to the beach and sleep in his car for a few hours of peace. At the beach, David took long walks trying to sort out his scrambled mind. One day, he made a decision. As he later explained in a letter, I was determined that I must slay a woman for revenge purposes. For all the suffering, mental suffering, they caused me. The 23-year-old Berkowitz paid a brief visit to his adoptive father in Florida. Nathan witnessed his son staring in the mirror, pounding his head with his hands. He tried to get David psychiatric help, but the young man refused, saying no one could help him, that it was too late. When Berkowitz left Florida, his vengeful fantasies grew more concrete. He drove to Houston to visit an old army buddy who innocently helped Berkowitz buy a 44 caliber bulldog revolver to protect himself, Berkowitz said, on the long trip back to New York. Out of the darkness of his rage, the weapon was his final solution. In his tormented mind, the barking of the dogs became unbearable. With his anger and sexual frustrations mounting, it was just a matter of time before Berkowitz would express himself with his gun. Before I came to know the Lord, my flesh was just going crazy and had no control over anything. It didn't even try to control me. You know, back then, uh, I committed some very serious crimes. Six, six murders, injured a lot of people. In the summer of 1977, New York lost its mind. We had uh, a blackout in which 3,000 people were arrested. You know, it was a very, very different time and people were afraid to walk around. Well, the city is preoccupied with the killer who in one note signed himself the son of Sam. Most of the victims have been young women with shoulder-length dark brown hair who were gunned down as they sat in parked cars or walked the sidewalks of the Bronx and Queens. I ran down. By the time I got down, she was dead in the street. My daughter was 18 years old, and that's what he took out of my heart, 18 years. He struck again over the weekend, shooting a young couple in a Brooklyn lover's lane, and today the girl died, the killer's sixth victim. He's wounded seven others. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We've been shot. We've been shot. What do you remember from 
the shooting itself. The bullet totally destroyed the left eye and most of my right eye. Where the bullet struck me, right in the head, I never felt anything. I, it just hit me directly in the head. And it traveled right across to the right side of my head. The only substantial clues so far have been two letters, including one mail to the New York Daily News. He was writing about a dog that talked to him, gave him orders to kill. On July 29, 1976, Jody Valenti was dropping off her friend Donna Loria in the Bronx. Berkowitz drove by and saw the two girls laughing and talking. He parked his car two blocks away and walked back. Then he circled the car at a distance, like an animal stalking its prey. Jody turned her head and saw Berkowitz's piercing eyes. She said, who's that? As Donna turned to look, Berkowitz pulled his gun out of a brown paper bag and fired. In the silence that followed, Berkowitz was frozen. Jody pounded the car horn. Berkowitz popped out of his trance and ran. Donna's father burst out of the apartment building, screaming for help as he gathered his daughter in his arms. But she was already dead. Jody survived a bullet wound in her thigh and was able to give police a description of the killer. He didn't know if he had killed anyone until he read the New York Post that afternoon. After that, Berkowitz was out every week, cruising neighborhoods that bordered highways. In the fall of 76, he wounded two more young women, as well as a man who he probably mistook for a woman in the darkness. Donna DeMasi was shot in the neck. Joanne Lomino was paralyzed from the waist down. And Carl De Niro would end up with a metal plate in his head. Berkowitz was nervous during these first few attacks because he realized he was crossing over the greatest moral divide. I was cognizant of finally being able to pass that point in which a human plays God, he would later confess. I was anxious, excited, and tense. On a frigid night in January 1977, Berkowitz, with his gun in his pocket, cheerfully helped some stranded teenagers push their car out of a snowbank. And yet, later that very same night, Berkowitz crossed paths with Wall Street secretary, Christine Freund, who was in a parked car with her boyfriend. She was shot and killed. Her boyfriend was unharmed. Up to this point, police still had no clue that the murders were related. The detective assigned to Freund's case sent the bullets to the ballistics lab for analysis. I walked into the ballistics unit in the police academy. I met with George Simmons, and my purpose of going there was to meet him specifically, not his boss, not another ballistics detective, but him, because I had a lot of faith in him. And as I walked in, he said to me, Joe, we have a psycho here. Simmons explained that he had seen the same bullets in three other shootings since July. He was convinced they all came from the same rare kind of pistol, but he couldn't prove it yet. The fifth attack took place on March 8th, five weeks after the murder of Christine Freund, and less than 100 yards away in Queens. Virginia Voskaritschian, a college student, had come to the U.S. with her family from Bulgaria, and only a year before had been made an American citizen. It was 7.30 in the evening when she was walking home from classes. This guy walks up to her, and she sees the gun in her face and puts her school books in front of her, and he fires through the school books and puts a bullet in her brain. This time, police were able to match the bullets to the first murder. No one could deny that there was a serial killer on the loose. The police dubbed him the 44 caliber killer and braced for him to strike again. Panic seized the city. Women cut their hair short and dyed it blonde because they thought the killer was gunning for long-haired brunettes. I thought about the 44 caliber killer every day since it happened. I go to beauty school up the block, and most of the girls are wearing their hair up because they're afraid of the 44 caliber killer. They wear it up. One thing that I really don't do anymore is sit in parked cars. The following week, he was on the hunt again. At 3 a.m. on April 17th, he was headed home when he saw two heads over the seat of a car. This was uh, probably the worst night of my career. Uh, I was in charge of the nighttime detail. Right 
And we always felt, in, in investigating homicides, people are creatures of habit. So we always cover the areas where they already hit. Less than four blocks from where Donna Loria was killed, Berkowitz waited as a patrol car passed by and disappeared. He walked toward the car, dropped a note at the scene, and then fired. Valentina Suriani and Alexander Esau were both shot and killed instantly. The note Berkowitz had dropped at the crime scene was the first solid lead for the police. It said, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I love to hunt, he wrote, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. I don't want to kill anymore. No, sir, no more, but I must honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. He ended with a warning. Let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back. Berkowitz had raised the stakes and police responded. A task force was formed to coordinate the search for the killer. It was the most extensive manhunt in the history of New York. Somebody came up with the theory that the MO of this particular shooter was exactly the same as a scenario on Starsky and Hutch. Right, so we sat and watched every Starsky and Hutch episode. That's how minute we got about this thing. A few days after Valentina and Alexander were murdered, Berkowitz wrote another letter to Sam Carr, saying that his life was destroyed and he had nothing to lose anymore. I can see there shall be no peace in my life until I end yours. A week later, Berkowitz shot and wounded Sam Carr's dog. The New York papers appealed to him to turn himself in. Berkowitz responded with a dark, chilling poem to the Daily News. It read, Hello from the gutters of New York City, which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine, and blood. I am still here, like a spirit roaming the night, thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest, anxious to please Sam. I love my work. Now the void has been filled. On June 26, 1977, Berkowitz staked out a disco in Queens. Sal Lupo and Judy Placido were wounded but survived. Because he was faceless, because he was coming out of the shadows, because he would strike from behind, everybody figured anywhere they were, this guy could be over the hedge or around the corner waiting to get you. There was palpable fear in the hearts of people in the streets of the city at night. One man terrorized 16 million people. As the first anniversary of the killing spree approached, the city still cowered in fear, wondering who the son of Sam really was and what he had in store for them next. By July 1977, as the first anniversary of Donna Loria's murder approached, one paper boldly proclaimed, Death Day. Another asked, tell us, Sam, what have you planned for us tonight? The streets were eerily quiet on the night of July 29th, and it passed without incident. Two days later, on July 31st, Stacy Moskowitz and Robert Violante went out on a date in Brooklyn. Before Stacy left, she and her sister joked that the odds of crossing paths with the son of Sam were a million to one. That night, Berkowitz was hiding in the park as Stacy and Robert parked their car. He watched them as they played on the swings. Back in their car, they were kissing passionately. Berkowitz fired four bullets into the passenger side window. He stood there mesmerized and then ran. Robert Violante lost one eye and was partially blinded in the other. Stacy Moskowitz lived for 39 hours and then died. The entire city felt they'd lost a child. And the atmosphere the next day of the city changed from this terror to an anger and sympathy. You know, we're gonna get you, you son of a bitch. Whatever happens, we're gonna get you. By now, Son of Sam was so notorious that Stacy's murder made headlines all over the world. 
What he was doing was manipulating, dominating, and controlling society. And now this insignificant nobody, someone who feels like he's one grain of sand on a beach with billions and billions of grains of sand, he is important, and he finally has arrived. It was only then that the son of Sam gave police the clue that would lead to his arrest. The night he killed Stacy Moskowitz, Berkowitz watched the police write him a ticket for parking his Ford next to a fire hydrant. A week later, he dutifully paid the ticket by mail. The police traced the license plate cited on the ticket to the name David Berkowitz. They quickly discovered that he had been sending harassing letters to a number of people and that a man named Sam Carr claimed Berkowitz had shot his dog. Out of a pile of hundreds of tips and complaints from the public, Berkowitz's name appeared three times. On August 10th, 1977, a large team of detectives staked out Berkowitz's apartment. The end was anticlimactic. Berkowitz walked out of the apartment building with a brown paper bag and got into his car. A detective approached the car and told him to freeze. Berkowitz turned around and said, well, you finally got me. The officer asked, who do I have? Berkowitz said matter-of-factly, the son of Sam. On the seat next to him in a brown paper bag is the 44 caliber gun that did all the shootings. No resistance, no shootout, no nothing. You got me. You got the son of Sam. The police brought him in for questioning, and the media descended on them. He came almost in a, a spotlight. There was a surreal feeling about it. We're finally putting a face to horror and terror. Berkowitz confessed to all of the Son of Sam murders, revealing details that only the killer could know. He enjoyed talking about it. Uh, he enjoyed being able to give us what we and he only knew. Facing the public for the first time, Berkowitz could not keep from smiling. Berkowitz showed no obvious sign of his dark, vengeful interior. He was cooperative and polite. When detectives asked him why he had paid his parking ticket, he responded, because I am a law-abiding citizen. Six innocent young people dead, many others seriously wounded. With his capture, the mysterious identity of the son of Sam was made known to the nation. His name, David Berkowitz. Time magazine said that few killers have seemed as psychotic as David Berkowitz. One key investigator on the case called him loony, wacko, gone. But the courts ruled that he was sane. And after pleading guilty without a trial, David Berkowitz was condemned to six consecutive life sentences with no chance of parole. At a news conference, Nathan Berkowitz, now 68 years old, expressed his grief for the families of the victims. So forth. Did you have any possible thought it might be David? No, I did not. Upon well, learning that it is allegedly he, what was your immediate reaction, and how did you get the news? I cried. <laughs> uh, I think that's enough, Please. gentlemen, with respect to any, uh, any further... Berkowitz said he had been ordered to kill by demons originating from his neighbor, Sam Carr, who he claimed was the devil in human form. For eight months, Berkowitz was held in a bare tiled room in the prison ward of the Kings County Hospital. A hearing was scheduled to determine if he was mentally fit to proceed to trial. During the first few weeks of his incarceration, guards reported that the son of Sam ate like a horse and slept like a baby. He rarely got upset and seemed to be indifferent to his plight. In tape-recorded interviews with psychiatrists, the son of Sam tried to explain himself. And I had nothing against these victims. Who were these people to me? They were just people. I, I, I didn't hate them. I wasn't angry against them. So where did you do it? Well, Sam did it through me. He used me. He made me go out there and do it. He, I did it for him, for blood. Right outside Berkowitz's window at the Kings County Hospital, a death rally was staged. 
Many New Yorkers were filled with bitter hatred for Berkowitz, but none more so than the parents of the six murdered and seven wounded young adults. After I saw what had happened to my boy's left eye, I had wished that his eyes could be taken out of his head for Robert's sake. And I hope he lives a long time with this in his heart. And I hope he never has a minute's peace. Never. Never. Just once I want to get my hands around his throat. He took something from me. So wouldn't you feel the same way? You'd, you'd want to get revenge, wouldn't you? And, and if anybody tells me no, I tell them they're sick. Mike Loria and millions of other New Yorkers, and I have to say myself too, said, you know, yeah, he's got problems, mental problems, but he deserves to die. He deserves to die for what he did. Sitting in his cell, Berkowitz began to feel the same way. Suicidal feelings overwhelmed him. In a letter, he wrote that he was a cursed person beyond hope. The court ruled that Berkowitz was fit to stand trial. Ignoring his lawyer's advice, Berkowitz decided to plead guilty and be punished for his crimes. He asked to be put away forever so he would not kill again. Berkowitz wrote to his father, begging him to accept his decision to plead guilty. Once again, he told his father, I failed you, but it's over now. Please, let me have a little peace. In May 1978, the son of Sam pleaded guilty to six murders. A few weeks later, on the day of his sentencing, David threw a tantrum and broke the restraints on his straitjacket. The officers subdued Berkowitz and brought him into the courtroom. They bring him into court, and he's subdued, but he looks around, he spots Nasa Moskowitz, and he starts yelling at her, Stacy was a whore, Stacy was a whore. Before they could drag him out, Berkowitz screamed, that's right, I'd kill her again, I'd kill them all again. Nasa Moskowitz was standing up screaming at him, you son of a bitch, you killed my daughter, you're gonna get killed yourself. It was, a, it was an astounding moment. Berkowitz was dragged from the courtroom biting and kicking. The sentencing was postponed. On June 13th, a greatly subdued Berkowitz stood before the court. The judge said, it is this court's fervent wish that the defendant be imprisoned until the day of his death. The judge added that Berkowitz was an animal and he wished he could have given him the death penalty. He was sentenced to six 25-year-to-life consecutive terms and began his incarceration at the notorious Attica Prison in upstate New York. The following year, in February 1979, Berkowitz announced that he had made up the story about the demons. At a press conference from Attica, he said he never heard voices, he was not insane, and he wanted nothing except to be left alone and to spend the rest of his life in prison. Later that same year, Berkowitz was almost killed by another inmate. Fearing retribution, Berkowitz refused to name his attacker. Following the attempt on his life, Berkowitz seemed to become more introspective about his crimes. He wrote in a letter that he did hate women, especially women who dance, he wrote, I hate their sensuality. Berkowitz told a fellow inmate that he attacked women kissing in cars in order to prevent other illegitimate children from being born to suffer the way he did. Berkowitz settled into Attica and seemed to find some peace. For the next 14 years, he kept his silence with the public. Then, in 1993, Berkowitz came forward and revealed a new twist to the Son of Sam story that would capture the public's imagination once again. Prison is really a place of suffering. It's a place of hopelessness. It's a place of loneliness. You will see a lot of people who will not walk with a smile on their face. You will never see them smile. Uh, I've seen men who've committed suicide in prison. I know some personally who have taken their lives, who have hung up because they felt that they had no hope. They hung themselves in their cell. Uh, I've seen men stab and cut one another over the most petty things. Uh, in, in prison, there's such a high level of anger. Men are so frustrated. Men know that they've thrown away their lives and, and they're bitter. And they take it out on one another. They lash out at one another. Sin will destroy you. Sin will eat at you like a cancer and destroy your body, destroy your 
uh, your mental capabilities, destroy your, your spiritual life, destroy your emotions. I wish I could just go back into the past and change everything. Looking back, it was all so senseless. You know, being the son of Sam was the biggest, it was the biggest waste. It was the biggest lie that, that Satan had me totally deceived. I didn't know what I was thinking. I had just been programmed to kill. I hurt innocent people and I took innocent lives. And uh, that really gets to me, you know, I, I got like great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart over the lives that were destroyed through my own foolishness. And I have, I have no excuse to make, you know, I have no, uh, nobody I can put the blame on but myself. I don't think people can understand the, the depth of Satan's wickedness towards the human race, that how much he hates the human race and God's creation, and how he's so set on destroying people. And the younger he can get people, the, the, the it's more advantageous to him. I started out just dabbling in things, just toying with things, and I got burnt real bad. I know that the devil has a plan and a purpose for every person's life, and that is to destroy that person, to take that person to hell, to keep that person blinded to the dangers of the things that they're doing, and eventually to steal their soul. I was walking the yard, the prison yard, one cold winter night by myself, just walking in circles. And uh, one that, at that night, another inmate walked up to me and says, David, Jesus Christ loves you very much. I says, uh, what? He said, Jesus Christ loves you very much. He's told me to tell you that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. I says, listen, God ain't interested in me. You know, I appreciate it, but uh, God is not for me. I don't believe God loved me. I'm not a good person. I've never done anything good. Why would God love me? He says, well, you don't understand. He says, God loves you. And he says, if you'd let me, I'd like to be your friend. But we became friends, and uh, after about several weeks, he gave me a, a pocket Bible like this, one of these Gideon's pocket Bibles. And he said, read the Psalms. So I started to read the Psalms, and I was shocked to find some of the most beautiful words that I've ever read. And all these things began to touch my heart. Like for example, in Psalm 18, I never heard these words before. It says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God uh, in whom I will trust. He's my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from my enemies. And I says, I was reading this and thinking, my enemies? I says, yeah, I got a lot of enemies because in prison, uh, I, I was threatened a number of times. You know, I had to stand my ground. And one time, as you can see, a guy tried to cut my throat. When I was in Attica Correctional Facility in 1979, a guy had a razor blade and he snuck me. All these years, the devil had had my mind. I mean, I, I gave up on life. I gave up on everything. I said, you know, my attitude was, I'll leave me alone, man. I'm here in prison to die, and that's it. Well, I began to read these things for the first time in my life. And it says here in Psalm 18, verse 6, for example, In my distress, I called on the Lord, and I cried out to my God, and he heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. And he says, wow, you know, God hears. One night I was in my cell and it was near midnight and I was reading this, the, the Bible. I don't even remember what passage it was, what Psalm, but suddenly I just felt this overwhelming urge to just open up. I just, I just felt something come upon me where I says, God, you know, I can't take this anymore. God, if you're, if you're real, if you're, if you're around, if you're out there, uh, if you want anything to do with me, I don't know, but I, I, I'm just sick of the way I live. I'm sick of the way I live my life. I'm sick of all the torment that I went through. I'm sick of all the hatred. I'm sick of having to live with knowing that I hurt innocent people, knowing that I destroyed lives. I'm sick of the devil. I'm sick of being lied to. I, I don't give a darn anymore. If you're interested in me, if you could hear me, you know, let me just, let me just start pouring my heart out to you. In the quietness, 
I just started crying and crying, and all this stuff was just coming out of me. I said, God, I'm so sorry for living like an animal. I'm so sorry for all these things, Lord God. I don't even, I even understand what happened. Lord, it seems like I never had a moment of peace, God. I never had a moment of peace or, or happiness in my life, not real happiness. And, and I just began to cry. Maurice, Steve Wong. It's an honor to meet you, sir. Glad to meet you. Thank you for talking with us. Sure, okay. It's a, it's a big step, you know. I have step? my mis yeah, mis misgivings and nervousness and sure, all those sure. other things. Sure, sure. Understood. Uh, is this a special place for you? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a place of refuge. I've been locked up since the time of my arrest of just under 40 years. You just turned 64. Yeah, I just turned 64. Yeah. What would you tell 23-year-old David Berkowitz today? Uh, turn around before it's too late because destruction is coming, you know. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, that, that was not me. That was not me. There's this even the that name I, I hate that name I despise that name that which name that moniker son of Sam that was a demon the devil blinds us to the consequences of sin and as we move along it gets harder and harder to come to God as time goes on if you think that you say to yourself well I'll just wait for another day or hey man I want to have my fun first or I want to party down and this or that the devil has a trick for you. I've heard every excuse in the world um, for a person not giving their life to Christ. Uh, a classic with young people is, I've got plenty of time. Well, that's a lie from the devil. He'll say that you have plenty of time. And he'll say, you know, uh, the way of Christ is right, but give it some time. Give it some time. And uh, sure enough, we give it too much time and we end up in the grave before we make that decision. God is in the ghetto. He's in the suburbs. He's everywhere calling people to himself. And every person needs to know that they have to make a decision. This is a serious matter. It's a matter of life and death. Many of you that are hearing this message, you're not gonna to listen to what I say. And maybe perhaps in a short time, you're gonna leave this world. Maybe some of you are going to die violently on the streets. Maybe some of you are going to overdose on drugs or die in some car wreck as a result of alcohol abuse. At one time, these hands were being used by the devil to destroy. But I thank God today for his great mercy that these hands are being used to touch lives. Sometimes I just get so happy and so thankful of what Jesus Christ has done in my life. Here I am, a murderer. A, a man locked behind prison walls now for 19 years. And yet God has shown me that he was willing to forgive me and give me a whole new life. Today, God is using me here in the prison to minister to other men, to give them a message of hope, to give them a message of encouragement, to let them know that Jesus Christ wants to help them, that Jesus Christ can set them free from sin's power, that Jesus Christ can give them a life, that Jesus Christ can rebuild their broken life. And, that, and he will put the pieces back together. If God will save someone like me, a murderer, and make me into a minister today, he'll do that for anybody. He can say, nobody is beyond the hope of God's reach, outstretched hands. Nobody is beyond the hope of God's love. At one time, I was called the son of Sam. Today, God has said, you are now the son of hope. That's my new name, Son of Hope, because I tell everyone that there is hope in God. Uh, a lot of this was uh, the suffering I brought on myself through my own sinful actions. And, uh, but God is good, but God is good. And he's brought me a long ways. I, I think in all seriousness and soberness, when I, I shudder to think what my life would have been if I never came to Christ, I honestly believe that I would not be alive today. I probably would have taken my life because in my times of depression and darkness, there was really no reason to get up in the morning, no reason to go through the day. It was a lot of pain, a lot of mental and emotional anguish and guilt and torment and all these things that I was carrying. And when I came to the Lord, you know, the Lord began to change all those things. Yeah, okay, that sounds easy. That sounds like just words. People could say, yeah, sure, right. I don't expect people to believe me, but that doesn't matter because the Lord is still working through me, and so that's, that's really what counts. So I'm, I'm the Lord's servant, 
and I know what Jesus Christ has, has done with my life and, 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 and I'm so thankful for that. I began to read the Bible. I developed a thirst for the Bible. I couldn't put it down. I was reading it every moment. Every time I was back in my cell, back from my work assignment or whatever, I couldn't wait to pick up the Bible. That verse from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 comes to mind, that the Lord is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I could ever ask or think. I'm not worthy of these things. I don't deserve this. You know, I don't deserve all these wonderful, wonderful blessings of just knowing that God is using my life for his glory and honor and to think that at one time in my foolishness and in my, you know, wickedness that I allowed Satan to use me for his purposes. God has allowed me to experience in my own life freedom in many ways. The Lord set me free from a guilty conscience. He set me free from my self-destructive and self-sabotaging behaviors which caused chaos for me all my life. He set me free from the power of uh, depression, which I was afflicted, something I was afflicted with all my life. He set me free from the power of Satan because Satan had a hold on me probably since I was a kid. And I have uh, freedom to share my faith with, with other people. And I'm also free from that, that power of sin that had me bound for so long. Even though I've been behind prison walls for more than three decades, I no longer see the prison bars. My eyes focus beyond that. I see Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. My freedom is, is found in one word, Jesus. He reached down to me and he picked me up. And I think of his, of his sovereign love and I say, you know, Lord, why? Why me? Why me? I don't deserve this. And there's no answer except, David, I just love you. You know, just accept it. I love you. You're my child. I've cleaned you up. I've forgiven you. Just be at peace. I truly, truly, truly believe without any doubt whatsoever, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, I would be in hell right now. I would be lost forever in a sea of torment.